Hey everybody and welcome back to another video here at Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. Today we're going to be talking about genetic mutations, specifically viral mutations or how viruses mutate. We've been covering some of the new bird flu H5N1 news that's been coming around and certainly we've been covering COVID and you know normal influenza, I should say quote unquote normal influenza. And within that coverage, we've talked a lot about mutations and viral mutations and risk of mutation and this, that, and the other thing. We're also seeing it a lot in news articles. So we thought we would take a minute to dive into genetic and viral mutations, how viruses mutate, the different ways in which they can mutate. And then which ones are highest risk? And I think this will be applicable to a lot of the kind of current events um, that we're seeing now as well as in the future too. So stick around with no further ado, quick 30 second break for our introduction. We'll be right back. Hey everybody and welcome to Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking out the video. Here at Whiteboard Medicine, our goal is to create medical education content for all types of interested learners. That includes videos, practice questions, study resources, and much more. We would love for you to join our community by subscribing, hit that bell button. We're also working to build a high yield Patreon page. It's gonna be full of practice questions, video outlines, notes, commercial free content, and much more. None of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving on. All right. Thanks for sticking around. So quick shout out to our Patreon page. We linked it in this video's description. Uh, you can join for free and get access to a lot of the material. Um, in addition to that, we post pretty frequently, probably every other day, uh, for different kind of articles, events, tidbits, talks, that type of thing. So definitely check that out and join it. Uh, if you feel inclined, we'd love to uh, start building our whiteboard medicine community there on our Patreon page. All right, no further ado, genetic viral mutations. So when it comes to viruses, there's a couple kind of big broad categories of ways they can mutate, okay? Two of those big broad categories are reassortment and recombination, all right? And we're gonna talk about these two big, big broad categories. Similar but separate to this is how those mutations change the virus. And that is often called antigenic shift and antigenic drift. So if we take a step back and dive into this a little bit more, antigenic drift is when a virus's mutations are kind of just drifting slowly towards more and more viral changes. So let's just play a scenario here. Let's say a virus, this is completely made up, has 10 different proteins. Drift would be if every once in a while, you know, one of those proteins changed, once in a while, another one of those proteins changed, and it's kind of this slow drift, whereas eventually, if there's enough drift, you're gonna have a completely different virus, but there's not any big, single, massive change. That's in comparison to antigenic shift which is when there's some event that causes a big shift. The virus, again, making it up if they have 10 proteins, that virus in the snap of its fingers all of a sudden has five different proteins or half of their proteins are different. So this is when there's antigenic shift, it's a big change. When there's antigenic drift, it's a small change. Okay, both of these can be very powerful, right? If that drift, if that small mutation is something significant, it could totally change that virus. Right? If there's a mutation in one of the viral receptors that then leads to it being more likely to infect humans, even though it's a drift, it's a small single mutation, it can still have a big effect. Antigenic shift, though, is more likely to have a big effect because so many of the virus, virus has changed. Okay, so if we're just changing one protein for drift, it's almost like, uh, you know, luck of the draw. Goodness forbid that's an unlucky mutation for humans, aka that mutation just randomly happens to be a mutation that lets that virus infect humans. That's significant. But the vast majority of time, these small mutations don't really have any significant effect on the viral function. Whereas shift, if you have half of the virus changing, there's just a higher likelihood that within those changes, there's something that could lead to that virus infecting humans or causing more severe disease or being more transmissible or what have you, okay? This is in comparison or overlapped with reassortment and recombination. And we're gonna talk about these two below as well as these two below to give us a better idea. We're gonna be using this kind of viral model. So this is our just quick drawing of a virus. Uh, it's kind of modeled after influenza, uh, the H, and N, these are receptors on the influenza virus, hemagglutinin and neuramin neuraminidase. Uh, and then the genetic material inside is the RNA. So we're gonna start with antigenic drift, right? And antigenic drift, we kind of use the vague term of small changes. And that doesn't mean that they're not significant because they can be. 
But what happens is when a virus such as influenza infects a human cell, we're going to say that this is a human cell. All right. That human cell has all these cell receptors on it. And these, all these receptors are different. They attach to different proteins. Now, one of those proteins that they attach to could be one of the influenza proteins. So let's just say that this is a alpha-2-6 receptor, which is a receptor in humans that influenza can attach to. Well, this influenza virus is looking to infect human cells, and it goes, oh, I got a protein that attaches to this receptor. So the virus then attaches to that receptor, and the virus then gets endocytosed. It gets into the human cell, where it dumps its genetic material, right? All this RNA, all this genetic material in the virus, it dumps it into the human cell, and then it fools the human cell apparati to replicate its viral genome. So it might, you know, dump, again, these numbers are way off, but let's just say it dumps one RNA. It then hijacks the human cell to then replicate the viral RNA into multiple, right? Maybe it goes from one to three. Uh, it also then fools the human cell into um, using the viral RNA, the viral genetic material, and creating proteins. All right, and then those proteins are what are put back together into multiple viruses that then break out of the cell and can go and infect other human cells. But while the human cell is replicating the genetic material, what it literally does, and if we scroll to the side here, we'll just kind of do a, let's just say this is a genetic uh, RNA viral sequence. It's made up of all these different uh, nucleosides, and all these are a different the order of these are what creates the genetic code. And that code is then read by the human cell apparati. Um, that is a collection of enzymes that replicate it, right? So these have names, we'll just call them one, two, three, four for the sake of ease. And if it's in this order, the human cell has these enzymes that then travel along it and either replicate it into another piece of genetic material uh, in that hopefully same order because that's the order that creates proteins, right? Or it can then change this. Uh, another piece of cell machinery can read this code and then kick out a bunch of proteins, right? Maybe it's circle, triangle, circle, and these are all proteins. But we're gonna ignore this for now because what we're talking about is genetic mutations. So when that human cell replicates the viral genes, what the virus you know, theoretically would want, although a virus isn't alive so it can't want anything, but is an accurate, a replication of that genetic material. But this is a human enzyme. So sometimes the human enzyme messes up, right? Maybe it's going down and it's replicating. And instead of two, right, it accidentally puts a different nucleoside there. So maybe it's a kicks out green, red with uh, some black instead of all red, blue, and then black again. All right, so it made a mistake. There's a mutation, right? This is different than its parent genetic material. And that is what antigenic drift stems from. It's when, when the virus is in the human cell and the hum it's fooling the human cell enzymes into replicating the viral genome, the human cell enzymes just make a mistake, right? It's an imperfect process. And that leads to a mutation in the virus genome. Instead of being all black, it's got this red. Right, so it's a single mutation. And that mutation though then ends up packaged into all these new viruses that then goes out into the world and infects other cells. And if this mutation, there's a lot of different types of single mutations. Maybe we'll do a video on that too, but there's silent ones, there's one that cause change in proteins, et cetera, et cetera. It's pretty complex. But the thing to note is that this single mutation might not do anything at all. Right? It might because this viral genome is what's replicated to make viral proteins. So there's a chance it won't do anything at all. It'll just be the same exact virus. But there's a chance that that mutation could lead to a protein that's slightly different on the new virus, right? If this is kind of the parent virus here, you can see the yellow and green, right? Hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Uh, it's so hard for me to say that. Neuraminidase. Um, there's an extra syllable in there. But now the neuraminidase has this red protein, right? It was all green before, it's red now, so this is a mutation. 
in this mutation, again, might do nothing. It might be silent. It might not change the function of the virus at, at all. Or it could change the protein. And maybe this was actually bird flu, right? And bird flu has now a new mutation on its cell receptor that makes it more likely to infect humans. So it could be very meaningful, but it also could be silent. But the virus is just drifting, you know. Maybe later on there's another mistake and there's another mutation that happens. And over time, all these kind of mutations build up. And the more mutations that build up, the more drift that happens, the more likely the function of this virus is to change. But it's a slow process. It's a random process. It's not the virus going, I want to infect human cells now, so I'm going to mutate. It's literally just an accident. It's just a spoof, sporadic, random um, misreplication of the viral genome that then coincidentally leads to a change in a protein that may or may not be meaningful. But if it is meaningful, if this virus can spread more quickly, obviously this mutation is being selected for because this mutated virus is the one that's spreading more quickly. It's out competing the parent virus. And that's why these mutations that do lead to a change in function, if that function change in function is beneficial, that that variant then starts to take over because it outcompetes the other viruses. All right, so that's drift. What about shift? Um, we know we wrote genetic resortment here and shift. And antigenic shift as a term is kind of what we said was a big change. And antigenic shift can happen with both genetic reassortment as well as genetic recombination. So both of these things can lead to antigenic shift, all right? And what you'll see instead of drift, where there's kind of the single mutation that we talked about, shift, there's a big change. In something that we talked about with bird flu, actually one of our videos, we'll link it in the video description, um, is that bird flu infected some pigs. And that was a bigger deal because pigs are what we call mixing vessels. Because with genetic resortment, what can happen is that you have two flu viruses here. We're just making this up. Let's say this is bird flu. All right. The bird flu virus, H5N1. And let's just say this is, you know, quote unquote, human influenza. We'll just call it influenza. And as we mentioned, this is a cell. For the sake of this discussion, we'll say it's a pig cell. And pig cells have receptors for both bird flu and they have receptors for human flu. So human flu is floating around in the pig and goes, oh, I can attach to that receptor. It attaches that receptor and the human flu virus gets into the pig cell. If coincidentally at the same time that pig was exposed to bird flu, bird flu goes, hey, I recognize that receptor too. Attaches to the pig cell receptor and that bird flu then gets into the pig. Now this pig cell has infections from both bird flu virus and influenza A, human flu virus. And the bird flu genetic material is black, right? So this is bird flu genetic material. The human genet uh, influenza A genetic material is brown. So this is human. And as we said, the genetic material is just floating around in this pig cell, and it's fooling the pig machinery into replicating it. Well, what can happen is that when those um, genetic materials from the bird flu and the human flu are together getting replicated, they can accidentally get packaged into the same virus. And then that virus now has bird flu genetic material and human flu genetic material. And then that can lead to a virus that is built of both bird flu and human flu genetic material. It was a reassortment. It was a big shift. And then the proteins created are proteins that can both be from the bird flu virus and the human flu virus. And what can happen then is if we notice bird flu here, right? It was yellow and green receptors. Human flu was red and purple. Now you have a kind of new variant that is a combination of both bird flu and human flu that has both yellow bird flu receptors and purple human flu receptors. This is a really simplistic model of how this works, but that is what uh, people were worried about with bird flu getting into pigs. It's a mixing vessel. You know, any animal person that can get infected by two different viruses at the same time, if those viruses are of the same class, you know, these are both influenza viruses. One is bird influenza, another is human influenza, that those genetic uh, material from the two separate viruses can kind of get mixed together and genetic reassortment can occur where then a single new virus made of proteins from both the bird flu virus and the human flu virus can be the product. 
And that then can obviously lead to a big antigenic shift, a big change. This is not just a single protein. This is the whole receptor is now different, right? It's now a combination of bird and human flu. And that can lead to those events that are unexpected where viruses jump from animals to humans and then obviously can cause epidemics and pandemics and all sorts of stuff. So that's genetic reassortment that leads to antigenic shift. It's a big change, a combination of genes from the different viruses. This is similar to, but is distinctly different from genetic recombination. All right, genetic recombination is, again, let's just say it's a pig, a pig's mixing vessel. Pigs, as we talked about, have receptors for both bird flu. This will be bird flu and human flu. Right, this will be a receptor for human flu. And if, these, if this pig gets infected by both bird flu and human flu at the same time, bird flu says, hey, I recognize that pig cell receptor. I'm going into the pig cell. Human flu says, hey, I recognize that human cell receptor. I'm going into the pig cell. Um, and they dump their genes in here. Instead of in reassortment, where you kind of get these whole genome sequences from the individual viruses, genetic recombination is when while the pig cell machinery is being fooled to replicate the viral genomes, the machinery just gets confused and messed up and combines, recombines, recombination, recombines both human, which is brown, and bird genetic material into a single new gene. So it's a combination of both the bird in black and the human in brown uh, RNA sequences from the viruses. And obviously that then can lead to a whole new segment of RNA that's a combination of the two can lead to the creation of new proteins that are a combination of both bird flu and human flu, and then can lead to a virus that is antigenic shift that is much different than the parent viruses, right? Because it's a combination, it recombined the gene segments. So as we said, bird flu, green and yellow receptors, human flu, purple and red receptors. Now we have this recombined, much different virus that is kind of a combination of purple from human, yellow from bird, green from bird, red from human, all these uh, viral cell receptors that then can lead again to a new virus that can jump out of animals and infect humans. Um, so genetic recombination and genetic reassortment can be big concerns, which is why people are so cognizant when animals that can be infected by both bird viruses and human viruses um, start to be infected by bird viruses because if we're just unlucky, right, this is all random. If we're just unlucky enough that a pig gets a human virus, a bird flu virus, and unlucky enough that in one of those pig cells, there's a recombination event or a reassortment event, that that can lead to a huge change, a huge antigenic shift in the new kind of combination of bird and human flu, the new hybrid virus that then gets kicked out and can cause disease that's unexpected. So we simplified all these concepts a lot. This by no means is like a deep dive for those uh, dense in uh, the scientific world, but this is hopefully a bird's eye view of some of these concepts to help us better understand why uh, and how viruses mutate and when those mutations can cause some real concern um, versus when, you know, still could be some concern, but almost just an unlucky coin flip um, in other cases. So let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Uh, certainly subscribe, hit the bell button, check out that Patreon page. Um, in any case, stay well, keep learning. We'll see you next time.